All right, it's Ty here. Welcome to the next in the 67 steps. Principles, guidelines to live the good life, health, wealth, love, and happiness. Everything you want out of life. This is what you must stick to. Again, you're getting a little bit through this, but you got to keep going all the way to the end. Today, what we're going to talk about is something that I learned um, at the Amish. Uh, it's called, and, and beyond, it's called the Amish Vacation, Tap Dancing to Work, and avoiding what you love. How to set up your life so that your work is your vacation. So I was early 20s. I'm in Holmes County, Ohio. Farm country. Amish guy. I was uh, staying with this guy, David uh, uh, um, David Klein and his family. who was nice enough to let me stay there. And uh, a lot of weird things in my life at that point. My family issues and my mom was getting divorced I was kind of going through uh, I don't know what you would call it but a, a crisis of life and faith and understanding didn't know what religion I wanted to believe in what career to pursue socially who I could trust and uh, so I took this I read this book Amish Society by a guy named Hostetler I think I have it on my book recommended book list it made the cut from one of the books i've read into the ones i would recommend for you on my site uh and so i was reading that book and i was like these people seem to know something so i went holmes county ohio it's the largest group of amish remember amish if you don't know they're not mormon uh sometimes people get confused they're not a cult they're really just they're german came to america a long time ago and they still live old-fashioned that's basically but in terms of how they believe, if you want to know what the world was like 100 years ago, you can go visit the Amish. They, they stand out now, but 100 years ago, everybody was kind of like them. So I'm there with the Amish, and over the years, two and a half years, I learned a tremendous set of wisdom from them. People that are connected to the earth, farmers, you know, people close to nature, they have a special wisdom that, I, that I've been happy uh all these years afterwards to have had implanted into my brain. So I want to pass on some of that because that was a unique opportunity that's not everybody gets the chance. I was lucky. And, and um, so there was an Amish farmer. I, I don't remember his name now. He's 65 years old. And uh, he's a dairy farmer. He milked cows by hand. If you've ever done this, it's very hard on your hands. It's hard work. Cows need to be milked 365 days a year. Uh, no vacations or, or no holidays for the cows, right? They milk them year round on this guy's farm. And I looked at him and I was like, when's the last time you took a vacation? He started at four every morning, had to milk, took about two hours before breakfast. Then he milked every night, 4 p.m. or afternoon. And I said to him, I was like, when's the last time you took, took a vacation? And he said, Ty, I took a vacation when I got married, when I was 20, 21 or 22. Now, this is a guy who's 65, and he said, you know, I was sick a few times. I missed a few, but basically, he looked at me. I mean, the first, I'm kind of oversimplifying. He looked at me kind of with in, incredulous, like, what do you mean? As if the word vacation, I'm pretty sure. I don't know the German word. I used to know the Pennsylvania Dutch that the Amish speak, but I don't think they have a word for vacation in the sense that we do in the modern world. Um. Now, the interesting thing, you might say, well, what does that have to do with me, Ty? Well, the smile on his face uh, was as bright and sincere as any person in the modern world that I've seen since. He was surrounded <clears throat> by his wife, been married to since he's 21. I don't know, five, ten children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews. He was part of a, they're Christians, they're part of a community of people, uh, of faith, similar faith. He had friends that he had grown up with from five, six years old all around him. He had his parents around him. Every day he was connected to nature in harmony, you could say, in a certain sense. Now, I'm not trying to oversimplify and say that everything's perfect there, but I'm telling you, I've seen happy people before, and I've never seen as many as I saw there. And later I found out the research backs this up. Jared Diamond here in LA, UCLA, the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, historian and 
writer. He wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel. If you remember in that book, another one of the recommended books that I have, he said five, uh, uh, the Amish are, have one-fifth of the depression. Now, how can that be? And this was, of course, not a typical. This was typical of the Amish to not take vacation for 40 years. So have you and I been lied to? Well, I'm going to say yes and no. Yes, in the sense that we think that we will derive some level of happiness. There is an end game to vacation. There is no end game to vacation. There is no. In fact, a life where the end game is vacation is a pathetic life, I believe, if you and I live out that life. So, you know, I call this uh, the Amish vacation tap dancing to work and avoiding what you love. So there's multi this is a multifaceted conversation. You know, we've talked about Picasso, the Picasso's dichotomy. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. I think that's coming up here. Can't remember which one that is, but uh, as a little preview, you know, Pablo Picasso, see if I can find the exact quote. I love this quote by Picasso. Uh, let's see if I can find it while I'm recording. <laughs> uh, but the Amish vacation is one, as we've talked about before, the integrated life. It does Now, you may need downtime. And now, the Amish, for example, Sundays is specifically a day. Every Sunday, it's downtime. And even Saturday, they don't work quite as much. Um, so I think there's okay to some ritual of downtime. I take downtime, you know, you notice that I review movies and sometimes people are like, oh, why do you see these d dumb movies, Ty? And I'm like, well, uh, I think that, you know, for me, movies are downtime. I go see mindless movies. I mean, I, I like actually to see m mindful movies or ones that make me smarter, but occasionally I'll go into just a fun, you know, I just saw Godzilla or something the other day. And so I think downtime as part of a cycle is okay. The problem is when it becomes a non-integrated part of your life. For example, I was just in Europe and if you're in Europe, I admire many things about Europe, but man, most Europeans are just literally their big bragging point about Ameri over Americans is, oh, you Americans work too hard. You only get one or two weeks vacation. We get one or two months. And at first, that's like, wow, that's amazing. But then I'm like, are you comparing pathetic to a little more pathetic? Aren't they both pathetic? Now, I'm not looking down on a person if they have a nine to five job. That's not what I'm saying. But to say that I'm so excited about my life because out of 12 months, two of them I enjoy. Yeah, I will call that pathetic. It might be a necessary evil that you have to be in. I've been in situations like that, but my advice to you is move as quickly as is reasonable into a life where it's more like the Amish vacation. There's a smile on your face because everything is unified as a whole. Family interactions, community and social interactions, romance, love, friends, family, career, motivation. It's all there. Higher purpose, whatever your higher purpose must be. Do not live for a vacation. <clears throat> I'll pull up this Picasso here. I think I almost have it memorized. Right, here we go. Never permit a dichotomy to rule your life, a dichotomy in which you hate what you do so you can have pleasure in your spare time. Right? That is a nightmare. <clears throat> Look for a situation, Picasso says, in which your work will give you as much happiness as your spare time. Not sure there's ever more sage and wise words for you and I. Uh, Joel Salatin was here at my house in Hollywood the other day. First mentor, he said the same thing. He said, Ty, if you have a job that you need a vacation from, just never come back. <laughs> that was his advice. I think he and Picasso were saying the same thing. A life built around vacation is really no life at all. So if that is true, then, you know, what's the next point? Well, people then go... Well, Ty, that the answer then is you should do what you love. And if you notice, the title of this is Avoiding What You Love. Now, this is a tricky one. Alan Nation told me, he said, Ty, never do what you love 
because the second you do it for work, you won't love it anymore, meaning the repetition. He said, do what you like. So I want to throw that monkey wrench into this conversation because you may have heard this thing that I'm talking about with the Amish or Picasso, but you may not have heard this before, and I'm all about myth-busting and inverting logically to get to the answer. That's how you get to answers in logic. It's one of the classic tools, inversion. Uh, so if that's true for you, are you chasing another mirage? What do I love? What do I love? What do I love? Let me make that my job. I used to love salsa dancing. That's something I got into, and I was like, oh, I want to salsa dancing, started competing, salsa dancing competitions, all this kind of stuff. But then you know what? Fast, something interesting happened. I bought some nightclubs, and I made one of them a salsa. I had like a salsa night, and then I started teaching salsa dancing, and it was all part of the job. And you know what? I didn't love it as much anymore. <laughs> Once it was a job... I didn't quite love it anymore, but you know, the good news is I always liked it. So I also always felt a level of content and pleasure around it, even though that high, that initial high wasn't there. So what this means to you is we want to balance this idea of loving what you do, but more importantly, and I try to avoid this. I often don't counsel people that ask me, do what you love, do what you love. That's what everybody says. But as Alan Nation said, he said to think about getting married. Ty, he said, don't marry a woman you love, like he meant as an infatuation or lust. Because he was saying, once you get married, that goes away. And all you're left with is another human being that you have to get along with. So you need to have like. What he meant was liking each other out of friendship slash compatibility. And when it comes to your destiny, we've talked about, you know, Eularian destiny, uh, you know, kind of finding the intersection I want you to also, that's why I don't say it is one of the destiny circles that it has to be something you love. I said, what can you talk about on a Saturday night? But I didn't say, what is it that you quote unquote lust after? And I see many people pursuing life paths. They're like, ooh, I love this. I love redecorating homes. I had someone tell me this woman I know. She's like, I'm going to get into that career. But I'm like, but is it naturally suited? Does it match all the other criteria that I gave you? Is it a quote unquote compatible friend that you have a likability factor with each other? And she's like, no, 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 I just like it. Well, I mean, I just love it. I love it. It's like me. I love basketball. I love it. I love watching it, like going to games. I like playing it. Doesn't necessarily mean it should be a career and for me. It can just stay something I love. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's something I shouldn't do either, right? You might be getting confused. Well, I don't you do, you don't. No, it's nuanced. The answer, the devil's in the details. Beware of people generalizing answers. Oh, you want to know what you should do? Just do, it's easy. I can help you figure it out in 10 seconds. Oh, what do you love? Run from that advice. The odds of it being accurate for you are extremely low. And if you're not careful, you're going to go off on a wild goose chase. And the wild goose chase is going to spend the years and decades of your life that you will never get back. So my advice to you is find this balance where vacation becomes only a small part of the end game for you. It becomes a cycle, an ebb and flow of downtime. You know, David Klein there in Holmes County, it was cool. They would wake up at 4 o'clock. They had a dairy farm too. I stayed there. They'd milk the cows. And then at they'd eat breakfast at 6 in the morning. And then he'd take a nap from like 7 to 9. So he was actually integrating into his life cycles. Instead of what people do with vacation, it's like, I hate this job. I hate this job. You know, it's, it's February and they're like, I have my next vacation in April. So you go months of prolonged hating and stress what you do. And then you get on the vacation and you realize it doesn't undo the hate. Instead, what the Amish David Klein guy was doing was he was building into every day a ebb and flow and cycle. That's vacation. And when you do it that way, uh, you can persevere. Hillary Clinton in that book, Hard Choices, that I've read recently, she talks about she learned to sleep anywhere. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the great basketball player, learned to sleep anywhere. Richard Branson talks about in Screw It, Let's Do It, one of his autobiographies. He says, I learned to be able to catnap. See, 
when you're on your life's path and you're changing the world and you're impacting the world, you probably won't get prolonged times of vacation. In fact, when I meet people that are able to go on two months of vacation, I'm like, hmm, this is probably telling me you are not changing the world. You are not living an amazing life. Not to say that you can't occasionally take long vacations, but I'm telling you, look around you when you meet people are like, I'm going off for a month. I'm like, what do you do the rest of your life? It's very rarely interesting. Now, when I meet someone, <clears throat> let's say you meet, I met Bill Clinton. He was at my friend's house. If you ask him, when's the last time you took a month off for vacation? He's probably like, I don't know, when I was 25. Does that mean he doesn't live a life of tremendous levels of fulfillment? I guarantee you he's at tr higher levels of fulfillment than some guy who has 60-day paid vacation. Get the ebb and flow into the daily cycle, not into these long... And then, of course, you can have the... I call them rituals. Maybe for you it's Christmas, Thanksgiving, where you take some downtime a week. Maybe it's within every month there's one weekend where you go off and do... I talked about this business. For those of you who are on the business uh, level of, of some of the coaching stuff I do and the other, you know, besides the 67 steps, I talk a lot about this and how important it is. Maybe you take some set times to do family stuff. So it's okay with some ritual. There cannot be a protracted buildup for you looking forward to vacation and then you hate the rest of your life. That's the dichotomy you must avoid. And what the end game is, as I talked about here in the name of this uh, 67 step, is tap dancing to work. You know, one of the most fascinating, and I would say, uh, if you read Jim Collins, He's author of Good to Great, one of the great researchers on what makes business and organizations and people too, what makes them successful. I forget which book it was. I think it was Great by Choice or How the Mighty Have Fallen, one of these books he, he wrote quite a few. He says, uh, the most, most people when we think about uh, our lives or someone else who is more successful than us, we attribute it to luck, okay? He says in his research, the only consistent luck pattern that he found with top people, top organizations, it was not a what happened to them. It's a who event, a who luck, who occurred in your life. For me, 18 years old, Joel Salatin popping in and said, I've got an apprenticeship program, internship, mentorship. Do you want to be in it? I was lucky and... and it's not even what Joel always said, and I learned a tremendous amount overtly, explicitly when he opened his mouth and spoke some piece of wisdom to me. But more importantly than that, it's what I saw, uh, what I perceived without him saying anything. And one of those things is the man tap danced to work every day. I remember at breakfast I ate with the family almost every day for two and a half years, and his wife Teresa and Rachel and Daniel, the kids, he would, he would, you could see it's something genuine that I rarely see. I'm talking, I can go by years and not see this in somebody's face. You know, I do events in my house, some networking events and parties, and some of the most successful people in the world show up in the terms of sense of, you know, wealth, accomplishment. But many of them, I see it in their eyes. The gleam is not there. They do not tap dance to work. I've talked about this in some of the mentor tips you may have heard. I've got these mentor tips, which kind of like short videos or audios that I do um, that are on the site. And I talked about Richard Branson and uh, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett says, I'm 84 years old and I tap dance to work every day. I pop out of bed with a little spring intercept. Think about yourself. Yesterday, there was a spring there where you're like, yes, it's a new day. I'm excited. Genuinely. I'm not, the only time I consistently see this now is with kids. Adults, it just fades away. And I'm saying it doesn't have to. I saw it in that 60-some-year-old Amish guy's face when he looked at me with a twinkle in his eye. Like, I haven't. Oh, that's what vacation is, Ty. I haven't done that since I was 21 and I married. You know, got married. I saw a little gleam there. It was almost like a little mischief. Like, I know, like Ty, I know something you don't know. When Joel Salatin, every morning I'd see him around the breakfast table, I saw he was excited, he was driven. Part of that is because we grew up in a society that squashed entrepreneurialism for various reasons. 
some of those economic, some of those uh, uh, educational, some of those just plain laziness in our parents and our role models and ourselves. So entrepreneurs tend to have this vibe that I pick up more, but even among tremendous amount of entrepreneurs, I do not always see the tap dance in the eye, the twinkle there. Richard Branson says, you know, sometimes for me, speaking of himself, Richard, he said, when I am not having fun anymore, that's when I stop. And he doesn't mean that every day he has fun. There's things you got to do. Talks about when he, I think it was a hundred million or five hundred million dollar loan got called in. I'm sure he didn't have fun, and he persevered through that. His point, I think, he meant. I don't want to put words in his mouth. He meant when I don't tap dance out of bed consistently anymore, and what I'm doing, it's time to make a change. And so, I'm all hammering around the same point: the need for vacation, the longing, the looking forward to, is a symptom. Of a bigger problem, there's a systemic problem in society. And if you're not careful, it'll come into your life. Where we are tricked, where we are living Picasso's dichotomy. Where we are forgetting, if you have to go on vacation, if you have to go on vacation, because you're burnt out, you should probably never come back. My sister uh, in New York, the sister I didn't grow up with, but I met her later. She was dating or engaged to a guy. Interestingly enough, he, it's weird. It's like he had the same name as me, Ty. Only other guy I've ever met in the world, the same name, Ty. So I was talking to him, and he's like, I love to go deep sea fishing. I was like, what do you do? And he works in the housing projects in New York and Harlem, Bronx. And uh, he's like, man, I have to go fishing because I'm around so many crazy people all day. I literally am like, I'm going to go nuts. That's what you want to avoid. He's doing the dichotomy. Now, I don't mean that to speak down on him. We all get in situations that sometimes you can't get out of. But I'm saying it's not ideal. And if you, it's within your power. And remember, like Jeff Bezos says, it might be tough, but you can innovate your way out of this. If you set the right time frames, 18-month time frames, let's say, you can innovate your way out of many problems, including being stuck uh, as a slave, a salary slave. Now, remember, just because you have a salary doesn't mean you're a salary slave. It's a mentality. But it is definitely uh, often these two things are correlated. Or you could be an entrepreneur, but you could have been opportunistic in the pursuit of what you are doing. You could be like, ooh, there's big money. I read an article in Time Magazine or Entrepreneur Magazine. Or, ooh, my friend made a lot of money. Or, ooh, I saw the WhatsApp, so I'm going to make an app. That's opportunistic in a negative way. Uh, and... I was even reading E-Myth Revisited uh, by Michael Gerber, the famous book. Some of you, by the way, who are in the inner circle, I did a breakdown of this uh, real in-depth, a live call the other day. And, there, you know, I like the book. It's a business classic, but I disagree with some of it. And one of his, like, the definition of an entrepreneur is someone who takes advantage of some opportunity. I'm like, no, that's that's backwards, Mr. Gerber. <laughs> That is not, that's what most people do when they end up in a job nine to five rat race. You know, someone, I had a friend, he ended up working at a job because he got married. He was in college part time and he had a kid. So he reached out, he saw like an ad in the paper and he took the job and he was just going to be, again, most people, I'm just going to do this for a year, try to do college. But then they lock you in, it gets a little harder, the bills pile up. You get a mortgage, and the next thing you know, that opportunistic approach, oh, this looks good, this will get me by for today. Next thing you know, that's a 40-year career that you're trapped in. And most people don't have the courage or even the will and innovative power to innovate their way out of that, so they stay with it. So I agree, disagree. I love the book, uh, you know, e Revisited, but as I get a little more experience under my belt over the years, and uh, meet more and more people and do more analysis. And I realize even some of these great books, they've got some serious flaws. And I would say that if your end game is living a good life, that the E-Myth Revisited will give you a lot of insight about entrepreneurialism. But on this point and many other entrepreneur books that you will read, uh, in fact, I think the majority are flawed in the concept of pursue opportunities. I don't care. If you miss out on being the next WhatsApp that sells for $17 billion, we already know 
I think it was Daniel Kahneman or the Nobel Prize uh, winning uh, researcher that already showed there's a a uh, bang for the buck that eventually ceases to happen on making excess profits. People who make a hundred million are generally a bit happier than people who make ten million. There is some marginal reaction, but it decreases. What you really want to do is get to financial independence. So if you're listening to this and you're not financially independent, that is definitely correlated with lower levels of happiness. Uh, in most of the Western world, that's eighty to one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year that you need to get to that point. Beyond that, there is some increase in happiness. But my point being is, if you're pursuing, you're saying, "Well, Ty, if I follow your advice, I might have not." I, you know, Brian Acton, he opportunistically jumped into an app business. And he made seven, his company sold it for 17 billion and see if I had been more like you're suggesting, I would miss out on that. So what? <laughs> Millions of people try, most fail. That's the one in a million. And even if it wasn't one in a million, as Charlie Munger, the self-made billionaire says, there is no tragedy on you missing out on an opportunity that makes someone else rich. It's going to happen to you. Read Bob Hope. I, 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 the, the famous comedian, Walt Disney said, do you want to invest in this new idea called Disneyland? Bob Hope said no. But Bob Hope lived a great life doing other stuff. Do you think his life, his happiness decreased? No. Missed opportunities are okay. What the opportunities, missed outside opportunities are going to happen and they're okay. What you don't want to miss is the opportunities that you have that jive and mesh with you. Really aptitude tests you must begin to do and we're going to be talking more about this uh in, for those of you who are in the vip private um private program of the 67 steps you're going to notice that's you know i always tell people i this 67 steps um i want lots you know i, I want to make this opportunity so i don't really charge it, hardly any money for this right with the books and things like this that come along with it don't make money on it but the VIP private coaching for those people, and a lot of you watching are in it. When you put that together with the 67 steps because of the aptitude stuff, you, you quadruple the effect. And so the opportunistic mentality is almost as dangerous as this vacation mentality. And in fact, I think they go together. They go together. So I want you to focus on as Peter Drucker says, you can only build upon strength. No one can build upon weakness. I don't care how much potential money you think there is. Usually it's a mirage, and even if you get it, just look at someone like uh, Muammar Gaddafi. I read a book about him. I didn't realize he was such a truly insane guy. Just horrible what he did to you know his country and and uh, and. He was the richest, one of the richest people in the world at one point. But I wouldn't want to be him. I guarantee you put his brain under a brain scanner, dopamine, all these things. The man wasn't happy. And if you look at, the, if you read this book, I forget what it's called. Uh, but the, he had so much drug addiction, he was not happy. Uh, and so don't ever, you don't want to go to either extreme thinking money isn't important to happiness because that's been disproven. It is important. It's a foundational concept, financial, uh, the acquisition of scarce resources, which we call money in these days. Uh, and on the flip side, you don't want to over uh, overestimate what money does in good life. What John, what uh, I think Daniel Kahneman, Jonathan Haidt, some of these professors teach is that money... Uh, if it uses, it's used to separate you, the more money you make, the more unhappy you become. If you use money as a tool to bring you into connections, social connections, old friends, old family, uh, flying people in, that will increase your happiness. So money is this, like I said, it's this pit bull. Pit bull working for you, it'll save your life. The pit bull turned around, it'll rip your throat out. So, you know, as you bring this whole thing together, because we talked about a lot and, and you really got to understand all three. Number one, Amishification, meaning an integrated daily ebb and flow with some ritual to it, but no anticipation 
or life built around a anticipation of uh, spare time. You know, I like Tim Ferriss in the sense that he's a very smart person, but the whole methodology of four hour work week is beyond flawed. Uh, if, depends how you take it. You know, Tim Ferriss was on my Twitter talking about how it, to him, it's more about optimizing Pareto 80-20s, and I'm all for that. Uh, but many people understand it as the literal four hour so that you can lay on the beach or salsa, tango dance across Argentina or do karate in Asia or whatever. Uh, there's no end game there that you want. We already know this. The science is already in. It's like read the data. Read learned optimism. Read Kahneman. Read Seligman. Read height. Read, it's all in. The research is here. What makes you happy is the opposite of a lot of vacation time. It's what it's the gleam, gleam in the glimmer in the eye because you don't need it. You need downtime, but you don't need the anticipation of some far off time that doesn't solve a problem. Uh, anyway, you got to solve the problem. If you have a job or have a life that you need a vacation from, some far off vacation, uh, then you should probably not come back to that life after that vacation. You should use it as a springboard to go into something new. Next, so you take that, the non quote unquote vacation mentality. Number two, you turn that into the tap dance mentality, meaning where is, and I think you just literally go literal. Do you tap dance? You should not worry about uh, along the way um, this concept of, okay, well, what I what will make me tap dance may not be the best opportunity. Yeah, it may not be the best opportunity, but who cares? Who cares? Charlie Munger says, there's no great tragedy on missing out on a wealth opportunity. There's other ones. And even if there isn't, look at the clear, look at the media, look at the news. And I don't mean this to make light of a situation. Look at Robin Williams. All the money in the world. But at some point, he stopped tap dancing to work. He ta stopped tap dancing. And I tell you, when you stop tap dancing, uh, there will be ebb and flows. There will be times of stress. But I'm talking about at the core, when you know, has, and Richard Branson just makes it simple, it's like, I'm not happy anymore. Uh, if you are not happy because you are in the wrong place, then move quicker than later because you start rewiring the brain to stay and become acclimated to those things that you don't like. Now, you might be able to reposition yourself in the same occupation, in the same industry, in even the same uh, line of work. Sometimes it's minor. You don't always, and we're talk about this later, the 5% tweak. You don't always have to do these big jumps. That's all Hollywood fantasy right? But I'm saying realign, move around, ask for a promotion, ask for a job transfer, launch a new product, uh, retire one thing, get away from some person. You need the glimmer in your eye. I see it one in a million. One in a, I bet you if you did the math, it'd be a one in a million in the world. It would come out too. The good news is you don't have to be a statistic. You can be the one in a million, right? The mass of men lead lives of quiet Desperation, what is called resignation, is confirmed uh, desperation. Did I say that right, Thoreau? The mass of men live lives of quiet desperation. What is called resignation is confirmed desperation. I don't know. Maybe I got that wrong. Somebody want to look me up. I usually have it. I get so many quotes in my head, sometimes they blur together. But that, that is the point. Wide is the path that leads to destruction, and few there are that find it, and narrow is the way that leads to what you want. Uh, so as you take number one, and you go, ritual is okay, downtime is okay, vacation mindset is flawed at every level. Number two, uh, end game is a glimmer in the eye, an upturn to the face, an emotional drive, and the simplest gauge is literally 
look at how you feel when you wake up. Like I'm not joking when I say tap dancing out of bed. Do you, how do you, I think the best time, the most honest, you know how you notice like sometimes late at night before you sleep, you, you get the most stressed because you're like wide awake and everything seems worse. So I don't think that's a good time to evaluate your life because life always looks bad in the middle of the night or, or the stressors come up. It's the morning for me and it's probably, I think, because it's a resetting of the mind. You have the most glycogen, you've gone through some uh, rest periods, you know, some REM sleep, hopefully some deep uh, sleeping cycles and so on. So in the morning, I feel like it's an honest evaluation. Just like I've talked about before, when you're 14, 15 years old, you often have the best inkling at what, as to what you should be doing with your life. Uh, I think the same thing in the morning is that evaluation. If you're waking up freaked out and stressed, like I said, I've got a friend makes millions of dollars, says I wake up angry every day. I'm like, uh oh, you better stop. That sounds like a path you know, that all these celebrities end up that end up in places you don't want to be despite all the wealth. Don't get trapped by opportunistic thinking. Go back to the Eulerian destiny that will save you. But then number three, number three, number three, you must not forget. As you put those first two together, often people go, okay, Ty, I get it. Don't do what a, a vacation, uh, you know, don't have a vacation mindset. Make sure I do something that makes me tap dance to work. I got the answer. It's this passion I have, this absolute love for art or in decorating or for me, it was salsa dancing. This is the thing. As Alan Asian said, don't do what you lust after. Lust goes away. Lust exists for a purpose. Tremendous feelings of lust and love for a person or a thing. They are, I do not believe they are evil. They are functional purposes. That's why they're still in our brain after 10,000 generations but yet they are not something to build a life around. What they generally, I believe, the signs would show is that these tremendous upticks in emotion, they serve to drive you past fear and kind of a sedentary mindset. They give you enough emotions to help you explore. So I do think it's okay to use these tremendous urges of love slash lust to explore a relationship with a person or a new career or you know a new way of doing your workout or trying to find happiness but at the end of the day they don't last because they're not supposed to and if they did last at that high level you know it, it <laughs> take too much energy for your brain although obviously some people have a higher reset per, per point than the other i read that uh george mumford who was the psychologist for the chicago bulls came in helped michael jordan that they said uh Mort Mumford's like, when I saw Jordan, I was waiting for him. I wanted to diagnose him as bipolar because I'm like, this guy's up so much. There's no way he could stay there. But believe it or not, Jordan stayed there. And it's interesting. I'm going to tell you, I know not everybody listening is a sports fan, but there's competition as Poe Bronson talks about in uh, the book Top Dog brings out many interesting facets and lessons for us as humans, whether or not you like sports. Sports are important. There's a reason the Greeks, I think the Greek word was arete, A-R-E-T-E, -E, and they believe that sports uh, were not counter to morality. In fact, they made people great. That's why they developed the Olympics. So from Michael Jordan, he did not have basketball as his primary love. His lust was for baseball as a little kid. But basketball was something he liked. Interesting. Read my friend Roland Lazenby's book. It's amazing. One of the greatest sports books I've ever read called Michael Jordan, The Life. It wasn't because he loved basketball. He liked it. And he, as he began to grow taller, he had an affinity for it. And it made sense more in this Eulerian destiny kind of concept. But it, thank God he didn't pursue what he loved so don't fall into that trap. That's Hollywood. That's Hollywood. You got to be level-headed. You have to be cool. You have to be practical a little bit. Not too practical for those of you who know the PACE system, P-A-S-E, a system I'm trademarking, personality typing. There's practical, action, social, and emotional dominant forces that you'll have in your personality type. Uh, you want to learn from all of them. You want to to be quote unquote enlightened, you need to be a blend of P-A-S-E. Obviously you'll have some strength, but when it comes to this thing of long-term destiny, you wanna bring out the P, the practical side of your personality, as well as the other ones, but you don't wanna be dominated in super long-term things by pure emotion.
You must. That's where logic comes to bear. Each of the PASE serves a purpose at different functions, uh, different moments of your life. When you're doing long-term planning, you definitely want to have P. You know, I think it was uh, Dwight Eisenhower became the president, but was also one of the most boring generals in the military. Patton, they said, was the greatest subordinate general ever. General Patton. If you've seen the movie Patton, my friend Jeremy says it's the best movie he's ever seen. But Patton was a man of action and war and da-da-da. But you know what? He wasn't the best at the top. Eisenhower, who was boring, who liked plans and logic and this. and he, So Patton was better under the, the A, the action, the emotion was better sometimes in long-term campaigns, which your life is a long-term campaign. You need to be dominated at that instance uh, in a balanced way, but I believe dominated somewhat or balanced by the P. So you can be practical about this thing. Don't go running off uh, and devoting your life to some harebrained idea you got from a book or seems, oh, I always want, you know, when I was five, I want to be an astronaut, so this is my thing. Um, if there's substance there, it will stick around. Just kind of like if you meet somebody, maybe you're married, maybe you're not, but when you first met somebody that you really fell in love with, at first you might have had that feeling of lust or like tremendous emotion, but you might have felt that over a few people. Helen Fishner talks about that. You know, the three stages of love, testosterone, dopamine, oxytocin. Testosterone is that, that urge, even dopamine a little bit. That, But oxytocin is the one that lasts. That's the settling down. So over time, you want to experiment. You can use this tremendous emotion to experiment with different destinies. But the one that sticks around, the quote-unquote friend that's there, that relationship, that's the one you want to pursue uh, when it comes to this question of success and what you should, what your aptitude and strength is to build around. Very important you understand this. So here's my question for you. Complete this lesson, both electronically and write this in your three ring, 67 steps journal. You can keep that private or if you want to, you can email it to me at tytylopez.com. I do do look at those. Um, don't always reply. I don't have the time always to reply, but I glance at, at a good many of them, not all of them, but I do my best to get through them. And the question is, okay, is multi-part one, A, are you or have you been vacation mindset, uh, my, my, vacation minded, let me just say, life built around the dichotomy that Picasso says to avoid. Number two part question, and just say yes and elaborate a little bit on it. Number two, the last month, two months, year, is the consistent pattern when you woke up early in the morning, fresh. Have you felt like popping out of bed because you're like, the day is starting. Like Joel Salton used to sometimes go like this. I remember him. It's like, let's go, you know, change the world, Ty. Gleam in the eye, is it there? And number three, number three, are you in danger of pursuing something you lust after? as opposed to something that you like? If the answer is yes to any of these, I want you to write out what you're gonna do differently, whether it be mindset, a change of course, okay? Write that out on the website, socially, other people can see it, there's a power of that, and then write it out in more detail, private. Remember, this is vital stuff, vital. You, if you get this wrong, you can get 10 years wrong of your life, or worse, 40 years, 50 years, the arrow of time moves forward, never backwards as far as we know. As far as we know, that thing's moving forward. A day lost is not like a dollar lost. You can definitely make dollars back. Talked about Trump, 17 or uh, 7 or $9 billion in debt. He made it back. Now he's on top of the world. You don't get years back. Let's get this right. Let's do this together. Continue to rely, 